Hey everyone, welcome back to Citywide Blackout, your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. Well, it's once again time to check in with author Robert Stadnick. He's the creator of the popular Exodus series. And folks, we talked a lot last time he was on the show, but there was so much more, and we're diving right into that. We look at a series of short stories that he's been working on, expanding on the Exodus series, whether it's characters, plot points, or things he was just looking to flesh out a little more. We also talk about his other works, including a science fiction thriller and a superhero series that he began writing 10 years ago. Robert Stadnick, author of the wonderful Exodus science fiction series, joins me once again. Robert, man, I I am just so excited. I am very happy to have you back here, dude. Welcome back. How's it going for you? It's been going great for me. Um, The... uh... You know, the uh, promotion and the interviews for the latest uh, Exodus series, Infinite Retribution, has gone very well. Couldn't be more pleased about it. And, uh, yeah, other than that, you know, things have been just going very well with me. Um, you know, still cranking, cranking away at the writing and stuff, working on different stories as always. I like to hear that. Tell, tell me about what you've got in the works right now. So uh, I think I might have mentioned the last time I've been working on a science fiction spy novel. The amazing thing about it is, is that it actually ties in to my superhero novel I wrote many, many years ago, which is a flash of insight. And it's just a very small connection, but it's enough. And I was like, wow. So yeah, I've been working on that. Um, I've been working on short stories for the Exodus universe. I think I'm going to start, um, you know, posting um, short stories for, uh, you know, some of the secondary characters that were in the Exodus universe, kind of explore that some more. And actually, last weekend, I came up with yet another story for the Exodus universe, brand new starship. It's generally going to be kind of um, a misfit crew exploring space uh, on a brand new ship that, for the lack of a better word, is a jalopy. <laughs> it doesn't really work. <laughs> Design that did not work whatsoever. And... Um, one of the terror council members decided to start scuttling the ship to give some, um, some not too great terror officers a chance to prove themselves by giving them that ship and sending them off to explore deep space. So that is going to be uh, the latest Exodus novel that will be coming out somewhere down the road. So yeah, got a few things in the pipeline. Damn, a few? Uh, that's a more than a few. I I think I think you stopped with a few several sentences back but i I want to take all these apart here because there's certainly a lot here i want to ask you first about the science fiction spy novel because i read this i believe in your bio this was like one of the first things you worked on and then you had the idea for the exodus series and say okay that put that aside do this thing instead and you know several books later uh it's still going on what was it like coming back to the spy novel after all that time um it's been interesting um, I was actually hung up on the spy novel, and uh, I knew generally what was going to happen, but I just seemed to get stuck, and it seemed to be turning into a short story. I'm like, no, there's more that's going to happen. There's a lot more digging I need to be in these characters. And given the insight I had with the superhero novel, um, it still wasn't enough to propel it forward. Um, certainly, as I can create you know, kind of a universe, modern-day universe on Earth about those novels. But it took the introduction of a new main character to the storyline that really allows me now to take off with it. Really gives the interaction to the main main character, uh, introducing this this new uh, main character. And initially, this person was just going to be a secondary uh, character, just in passing in one chapter, and that's it. Now he's an integral part of the story, and it's made all the difference in this uh, in this novel for me to uh, to get it to completion whenever that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it just seems like you have so much going on at once. Uh, can you walk us through the plot for the spy novel? Yeah, so basically, it's kind of um, you know, it's kind of in the end. It's kind of a, it is. I think of it as just as a love story. So the premise is it's a CIA spy, and he's a very effective spy. He's in uh, he's operative in uh, in Moscow, um, and and uh, basically. Uh, through uh, through an incident that happens in his work, he discovers that he has an artificial intelligence in his head. And it goes from there, he realizes he has no memory of 
his past. Um, he has no memory of anything before uh, before being in Russia, and all of a sudden, too, he realizes that um, he has these amazing abilities that he can account for, and he realizes that he's a he's cybernetic. He he's a cyber for all intents and purposes. Uh, was cybernetic implants from uh, that was discovered from alien technology uh, from a ship that had crashed on Earth uh, uh, back in the fifties, Roswell, New Mexico. Hi, back to there. And so it's a story as he tries to uncover his past. He realizes that he gave up the life he had back in the states, and he has now to have this opportunity to make a difference in the world. He had to sacrifice his his life, and he gave up the love of his life. And so now the story is of him trying to get back to the United States and try to, you know, try to make amends to uh, to his love that he uh, that he voluntarily gave up and who has no knowledge who thinks that he's dead. Um, so that's what the story is all about. And then this uh, new character I introduced um, has to pass on his own. So as they travel together, they kind of, you know, support each other and open up to each other about each other's uh, about each other's past. And help each other as they journey across uh, across Russia. So the AI, um, what's their personality like? Is it is it kind of like a snarky, like buddy comedy kind of thing? How do these two get along? Uh, they don't really. Uh, the AI is a typical emotionless software program, and the AI's purpose is to kind of help guide um, the uh, the main character uh, as he utilizes his, his uh, cybernetic uh, ability. And uh, once he becomes aware, the main character becomes aware this AI exists in his head, um, it's kind of like, I'm stuck with you. And this AI is being very logical, very methodical about things, pointing out, you know, probabilities of doing certain actions. And, of course, it annoys the main character who is shooting off from emotion that, you know, no, we're doing it this way, I say, so I don't care what you say. And he has no way to escape this. this AI is constantly in his head. But this AI is also going to develop over the course of the novel as it adapts its variables and gets better understanding of how the main character, the main characters, uh, you know, act and interact with each other. You're also going to see the AI slowly develop, not going to become, you know, a sentient uh, being per se or anything like that. But I can say that the program will, over the course of the novel, you know, move from being logical, methodical to being able to accept and be able to try to anticipate um, you know, unknown variables as they come up. Hmm. For a story like this, is there a lot of time spent with like the world building and the research, or is it more just you know off to the races and see what happens? Uh, for this one, I can I actually have to do some research because I'm trying to since it's set in the modern day in current times. Um, I'm trying to get familiar with uh, you know the geography of the country of Russia. You know, some of the, you know, the cities I mentioned in Russia, they actually do exist. Um, you know, trying to plot a path of what roads are going to take as they cross the country. So I have to do some, um, you know, research on the geography of the, uh, of the country and learn about some of the customs and learning about some of the uh, secret organizations within the government and outside the government, criminal and non-criminal, that, that do exist in the real world. So I've, I've actually done some research, even though this is a science fiction novel, I'm trying to bring as much of reality to it as possible by providing some of those real world components. That to me sounds actually like a lot of fun. And I think I would be so caught up in that, that that would kind of figure out, Oh wait, I'm, I'm actually like writing a book here. Yeah. It's a nice change of pace from writing the Exodus series where, where I completely make up everything as I go. It's in the future of science fiction. I make up the technology and aliens. And I gotta say it is refreshing to be able to write a book where I actually have to do some research on it to see, you know, okay, what exactly exists out there, what exactly is is current, to be able to provide that connection to those readers who may have an appreciation to some, uh, you know, real components into a fiction novel like that. Plus, you also have, I think, to stick to more rules. Like with with like sci-fi, you can just do whatever. You can make up like whatever. Um, a guffin you need to kind of solve the problem and advance the story, but here it's like, yeah, you've you, you got to sort of play by the existing rules, otherwise it just gets kind of weird. Yeah, and one of the uh, you know one of the components is that you know a good example, you know the KGB doesn't exist in Russia anymore. It's been replaced by 
um, I hope I get this right, the FSB, and then you also have um, a component arm of the FSB, which is the president security team. So I had, when I wrote those organizations and uh, representatives of those organizations into the book, I just kind of, you know, say they're going to do whatever they want. I had to consciously think as operatives of these organizations, they're going to behave in a certain way. And I'm going to try to model them and behaving how they would actually, those people would actually exist in the actual uh, organization in the real world and stuff. So, yeah, there is definitely some restrictions that I've been trying to adhere to, to bring some realism to this novel. Does the book reflect like the current politics or do you kind of leave that out? So it's a little more timeless. Uh, I've left it out the politics out because unfortunately, especially with politics these days, it's can be so easily identifiable as, Oh, well, this, you know, this novel is talking about the politics as it exists in 2018, 19, 20, 21. So I leave the politics out uh, as much of it as I could out of it and keep it more of a higher level. Um, again, you know, with the organization like of the CIA, you know, I try to keep the operatives of the organization as real as I can of what I've researched about it. But I keep the politics of the uh, organization, uh, the external forces of the, like the government who may be currently in power, who may be currently run into, uh, running into Congress. I keep that out of the equation. So that way I try to, in that respect, make it as timeless as possible. Mm -hmm. Are there any like thriller authors that like come to mind when you're writing a book like this? Um, You know, not really, because I don't really, I don't read uh, thriller novels. So um, I had not, you know, really been engaged really in that type of genre because it it never had an interest for me. Um, You know, I like novels where, you know, it has a nice progression. You get some surprises here and there. Um, I think the thing about, you know, thriller novels, and I'm not saying this blanket about all of them, but a lot of them try to give you some sort of shock value. And that really doesn't impress me because, um, you know, if you're providing some sort of shock value, then to me, it questions what is the rest of the novel? Can the novel itself stand on its own two uh, feet? So that's why I've never been really attracted to thriller novels. I feel that, you know, many of them try to do that, that one type of great shock value. And then, and then you're going to stick with the story for the rest of it. I just kind of like the whole, you know, a good general solid story with some little surprises here and there, maybe a big surprise here and there, but it's not necessarily integral to the story for the story for it to, to really stand on its own. So how would you describe the pace of your story? This one uh, starts off, Pretty fast pace, mm-hmm. uh, right into the action. Um, you know, the story starts where he's you know in the middle of a mission and trying to complete the mission, and it's immediately you know there's there's action right off the bat, um, and then it, it settles down for a little bit, picks up again, and then the meat of the novel then after they leave uh, Moscow is you know there's some action, but it's really um, a tale of two you know of two individuals traveling together and trying to struggle with their own past and learning to depend on each other and learning to trust each other as they travel together um, until they reach the, uh, until they uh, get back to the United States to where you get some, you know, some more action. Um, and then, you know, of course, the, the resolution of what happens at the end of the novel. So, so this one is definitely different from the Exodus uh, novels in that, you know, I tend to not have the action right away, but this one, yeah, it's immediately that you got some good old traditional spy novel action that's going on at the start. That's cool. Very cool, man. All right. And you also mentioned the the different short stories that you have working on to kind of branch off from, from the main Exus series. I'm wondering, do you think you'll ever actually stop with this thing? No. <laughs> I've, reconciled, I've reconciled that the Exodus universe, eight novels under my belt, it's a part of my life part of who I am. I've, I love the universe I created. I love, um, you know, the situations, the characters. Um, I really enjoy being able to explore some of the secondary characters in the main series and see these companion novels into infinite retribution and the jump gate. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, the, you know, the, this new novel that I've come up with, with these uh, characters, you know, you're going to see some characters from the, uh, 
from uh, the past novels, um, but it's primarily going to be a whole suite of a whole new set of new characters uh, in the uh, in the Exodus universe. Um, I love the series. I love the world I created there, and I think it's just always going to interfere with my other writing as I come up with new ideas and new stories. I was hoping with this latest uh, idea I came into my head that. Oh, it's a passing thing, and you know, I will, you know, I'll just put it in the back burner and worry about it later. Now it's really gripped me um, pretty, pretty strongly. So I'm like, yeah, I, I'm going to be writing this book now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Now where the now where these are like short stories, they're not like full length novels. Um, do you have to really be up in the series to follow them? Um, for the short stories, yes, because the short stories really circulate around the first crew of, of the uh, of the Phoenix, and it's going to explore what happened at the Exodus project during the time the ship was constructed, during the time Admiral Johnson was running the project, and up until the ship launched, and even during its first uh, three year mission to locate the screen. I'm going to explore some of those uh, characters that may have been mentioned in passing, or weren't even mentioned at all in the novel. Um, you had over 5,000 people that uh, that lived and worked at the project. There's a lot of uh, stories to be told there, and I want to give the readers an opportunity to go back to the X of the series in that form by being able to see some of these characters, read about them, and kind of see, um, especially Admiral Johnson. I'm going to be writing some short stories about him, and with him, it's going to be uh, a darker tone. You know, I'm going to explore what he did to keep that to keep what he was doing in that project truly a secret for the rest of the world and from Terra. And so with him, it's definitely going to be kind of a new thing for me. I've, I've explored some dark uh, tones with some of the characters, like with Admiral Bestia. But so with Admiral Johnson, um, the readers are going to find out how far he went to keep that project a, a, a secret. But then we're going to also balance it out with some of the other characters and why they joined the Exodus project why they felt so strongly about the Admiral's vision to launch the ship and take it out into space. So you're going to have a combination of some good lighthearted stories, some good positive uh, things that people wanted to do to make the world a better uh, uh, world for themselves and as well for other people, as well as uh, uh, exploring some of the darker things. Very cool, man. Very cool stuff. Do you see these short stories as more of an expansion on the universe or is it more of a this thing that I that I mentioned? I'm going to flush it out a little more. It'll be a combination of both. So you know, especially with some of the characters that I had not even mentioned or I had brief uh, introductions uh, to in the Exodus series, you know, I'll flush them out some more. People will get to see where they're coming from, what their backgrounds uh, are. Um, but it's also going to be an opportunity for me to really uh, explore, expand the universe some more kind of explore some more of the uh, inner operations of, uh, of Terra, especially Earth security. Earth security, I didn't really explore hardly at all until near the end of the Exodus series. And I really want to kind of bring that organization to light in these short stories. Um, how I'm going to do that, I'm not exactly sure, but some of the characters have had some interactions with Earth security. A um, couple of characters I'm thinking of, they were part of Earth security, and until Admiral Johnson poached them into the Exodus project. So it's definitely going to expand the, uh, the horizons that I've already established on some of the organizations, people, and events in the series. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine this is also a chance for you to check some boxes, too, like things that you wanted to include in past books, but you couldn't because either it was just going to make it too long or it was going to be too much of a deviation from the main story. Is that the case here? Yes. Uh, one of the things <laughs> I wanted to explore is the ship commanders of the uh, capital ships, Terra's capital ships. Um, I had a chance to explore uh, one of those characters in the uh, in Infinite Retribution, uh, but um, you know, the other there were four, there were five capital ships. I want to you know explore and talk about those other ship commanders and you know really showcase what it meant to be a Terra officer in those times. You know how they felt entitled to be in their positions, how they felt like they were celebrities, a terror treat them like celebrities and the, uh, and the general population. I really wanted to explore those characters and showcase what a typical Terra uh, capital ship commander uh, uh, was like, you know, he or she, you know, how they operated and, you know, what they thought of themselves and what they thought about, 
you know, most importantly, too, what they thought about the Phoenix when it escaped the solar system. <laughs> wow. So how many books do you think, do you think we're talking in total here that is going to come from this? Uh, I know. How much time do I <laughs> in life? <laughs> I, uh, I won't move right into the Exodus series. I think it's going to be for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had it for, I've been writing those, these books for 10 years now. Um, I see no stopping in this world uh, with that uh, series and the novels. I think it's going to be perpetual. Um, I have a, a, you know, I was working actually uh, a couple months ago. I was working on an Exodus novel. It's taken place 700 years from, uh, from the main series. And it does introduce, bring back two main characters from the Exodus main series. Um, and I worked on that. But I've gotten stuck on that novel. I know generally what's going to happen, but for whatever, whatever reason right now, I'm stuck on that novel. I am kind of stuck at the first part of it. So I'm not sure how things are going to play out um, with uh, the characters and how the situation unfolds with the uh, threat that they're facing. So right now that's on the back burner. Uh, while I focus on the, uh, the the Exodus, the current Exodus novel that does take place in the 22nd century, so I still have that another novel in the Exodus series that's you know partially written. So yeah, it's this Exodus series. It's going to be with me for the rest of my life. So you know, heck, you know, my current path. It's like okay, another 10 years, I'll have another eight novels written. Another 10 years, another eight novels. So I could have easily 30, 40 novels in this uh, universe that I easily uh, cranked out. So you're just kind of trying to set, set some like record now, aren't you? Probably. <laughs> hey, that's great. You know, honestly, if, if this does wind up being like like a full bookshelf for the books, you know, it's pretty that, 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 yeah. that that's actually yeah, pretty awesome. So so all this with the spy story and the expansion of the Exodus series, we can stop right there. But you've also got something that I want to talk about before, and that is your superhero war, uh, books. You did uh, Tales of a Former Child Superhero 10 years ago. How are you building on that aspect of your writing? Um, I revisited the draft, which I have not touched in about five years now. It's been a while. And um, I look at it, and I want to, but I can't. I just can't complete that novel. Um, I did do, the last time I touched upon it, I did do a complete rewrite of one of the main characters because I didn't like the pace and I felt that he had gone backwards from the first novel. I was like, no, no, no. He has grown. He has stepped up to the plate and he's going to continue to do so, even with the challenges facing him. So I did do a rewrite and I probably got to about the halfway point of that novel and I've looked at it. I like what I see. I don't see any changes, but I still can't finish that novel. And I think it comes back down to these are the first characters I ever created. This, you know, the second novel in the tale series will be the last novel and it's going to be the finality for all these characters. And I'm just not ready to do that. And, and I don't know, it sounds crazy, but I don't know if I'll ever be ready to say goodbye to these characters, I may keep them in perpetual limbo for my own, you know, for my own satisfaction. Just so that way, I always know that they're back there somewhere, and they're always going to be back there somewhere. So I just don't want to let them go. I'm finishing that novel, I would have to let them go, and I'm just not ready to do that. <laughs> I know it makes me sound like a crazy person. <laughs> no, you know, if I hadn't, if I didn't do this podcast, I would agree with you, but. Knowing, but like talking to writers, I know how involved you get in the worlds that that you create. How did you get though into doing superheroes? How did that kind of come about with like your sci-fi background? Um, because I think because my initial, like I said, these were the first characters I ever created when I was in grade school. I thought about you know spaceships and space and traveling the stars and stuff. But when I was sitting in grade school bored out of my mind with the classes and stuff. I would sit there. I wouldn't write. I would draw these superhero characters, you know, and I would draw the adventures they were having. And I wish I still had those drawings because I would just get a big laugh of, you know, how my imagination translated poorly into drawings. I can't even draw stick figures for the life of me. But, um, you know, it just, you know, I was working, you know, I was working on the Exodus, uh, the first Exodus novel. I was thinking about the show and the characters. and then. 
you know, one day I just decided that I just was thinking about these superhero uh, characters I had created. They were kids. And I was like, they're adults now. What's going on with them? And I was just so curious as what had happened with them that it compelled me to write this novel. Um, you know, I was just as curious as any reader who has read the novel or that novel as to what was going on with those characters. And I was pleasantly surprised to see what had happened with some of those characters. And I was disheartened what happened to some of those other characters as well. But it was a great story. And it was, for me, it was a great way to see those characters develop as I developed from a child to an adult to see those characters develop from children to adults as well. What would you say are some of the changes that happen in the superheroes? Because most of the time when I see like, you know, young superheroes, it's in, it's in comics and, and, and other two things happen. They get older and just remain heroes, but older or they're dead. So how do yeah. your characters grow? Um, well, you know, the main character, well, one of the main characters, Rob Stevens, you know, he is the one who is responsible for, uh, for him and his friends getting their, their abilities. And he was a very confident child who could, knew he could do anything. Um, you know, almost, I would say, even as a kid, had an ego, could do whatever, you know, felt he could do whatever he wanted. And he winds up, you know, becoming self-loathing, no, no confidence whatsoever because of the choice he made that he felt that these powers that they received um, created such huge consequences for them. He saw people around him suffer tremendously as a result of these abilities, and he couldn't handle it. And instead of trying to grapple with it, he hid away from the world. Conversely, his twin brother, um, Nick, you know, he grows up to be this you know, very cavalier, easygoing, taking life by the bullhorns and he listens to his brother and like, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, we can't use our abilities as adults and I'm not going to or anything, but he's like, I'm going to do whatever the heck I want, whether that's legal or illegal. And he really provides a contrast uh, to his brother, Rob. And, you know, and for years, these characters, you know, they, you know, they cope with each other. They accept each other for who they are. Uh, but as the course of the novel, um, you know, they're both forced to, you know, to come into conflict with each other. If they're going to grow as characters, as individuals, they have to face what, uh, you know, what's coming down the road, uh, to them that they can't hide from the world from their, uh, with their powers and that they're going to have to use them if for nothing else, if they're going to themselves and their friends. And it results in conflict with the brothers because they have no other way to try to move forward unless they basically hash it out in a big fight. You know, it's funny we're, we're, that uh, we're having this discussion, and yet it seems like this may never see the light of day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing about, I mean, in the second novel, you know, the, um, you know, the characters, you know, they, you know, they continue to grow as they, you know, as they go on their, on their travels to, uh, around the country looking for others who are like them. And, you know, the brothers really, you know, you know, really step it up in supporting each other, um, even with the realization that, you know, it may not be a good ending for either one or both of them. They're still willing to face the, that possibility as long as they're side by side with each other. And I was unfortunate that I wish that, you know, this story reflected because these characters are based upon friends I grew up with, uh, you know. You know, the character, the two main characters is myself and my twin brother. You know, they're a reflection of who we are. And, you know, maybe in some respect, too, um, you know, I wish these stories would reflect how it is in the world. You know, unfortunately, you know, I had no relationship with my twin brother. But at least in these stories, there is a relationship. There is a, a bond there that I don't have uh, in, the, in, the, in the real world with my brother. So, you know, maybe a part of it that is too why I can't finish the, the second story is because. You know that foundation I base characters on just doesn't exist anymore. So, is this story kind of like a wish list for you on like a personal level? Almost. Yeah, it, it's a wish list of what could have been. The potential was there. The potential was always there. Unfortunately, it was just never taken you know advantage of. And unfortunately, people make decisions um, in their lives that are contrary. They're not good for themselves. They're not for the better, uh, betterment of themselves. You know, and it's a shame to see, you know, when you come across people in your lives that you see they had such potential that could have done so 
so much and they choose to waste that away. That's kind of hard to see. And, you know, this and my superhero novels is definitely a wish list of that. This is what you could have accomplished. You know, look past the fiction of the of the uh, superhero abilities. The potential was there, and it's in the in a, and I reflect that in the uh, in the first novel, and it's reflected in the second novel, uh, the portions I've written, written so far. This next question, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I am a little curious. Why don't you have a relationship with your twin brother? Um, unfortunately, because he, uh, um, you know, he's always had a very negative outlook about the world. Um, he's never taken accountability for his actions. You know, whenever, you know, he, whenever something happened, he would always blame other people. He would never take any responsibilities for his actions. And as a result, he could never grow as an individual or develop. And it simply got to the point where that you're better out of my life than in it. And I chose not to have him in my life. And it's unfortunate because so much time has passed. Um, that, you know, even if he came back to me today and want to reconcile, I would choose not to because too much time has passed. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're in our forties that we're not young individuals, you know, and he's done too many things. He made too many choices. That's like, you are who you are. That's just the way it is. And because of how you are and because, you know, you know, at your age, you've been like this, you know, your whole life, you're never going to change. And I just choose not to have you in my life because, um, you know, for me, I always choose, I like to have people who are positive, who bring something of value in my life. Um, you know, and unfortunately, my brother is not one of those individuals. He's one that you know, takes you from your life and brings you down. And, you know, I just, I have no interest in that. You know, it's kind of like I joke a little bit, just because they're family doesn't mean you have to love them. Very true. Very true. Given all that, and I'm not a writer in any real sense of the word, so this could be a dumb question, but why not just tweak the story so that maybe it's a little less reflective of, of your own life and you can get it out there and sort of see this part of your part of your creative energy out there in the world? Um, because, um, you know, because all my stories, every single one I've written has a decent component of my personal life in there somewhere. I think that's a big motivator for me why I write these stories, even though it's science fiction, even though the X of the series takes place hundreds of years from the present. There's a lot of components to my personal life in those novels. People who know me very, very well can pick off components of my personal life in these, uh, in these novels. And for me, these novels have always been not only an outlet of creativity for me, but also an outlet of therapy for me. You know, when things get stressful, when things get tough, you know, when I start, you know, having regrets about choices I made in the past or things like that, I can fall back into my stories and use that to kind of work through my own personal issues. And, you know, a lot of these stories, um, even though, you know, I give it, you know, I try to make it a positive theme about, you know, uh, about individuals, you know, a lot of it too is just, you know, allowing me to work through some of my own things. And uh, that's, maybe that's why I've written so many novels over the years is because, you know, I've really come to depend on my imagination and creativity to get through a lot of some things in my life. How about the last year and a half? How has how has writing helped you to get through what for everyone was an extremely stressful and difficult time? Uh, for me, it was you know it was great being able to fall back into my imagination and dive back into some of these worlds I created because you know for the last year and a half we were we were on the we had the pause button on you know we couldn't do anything. Thing, couldn't go out. I'm an individual who can never sit still. I'm rarely at home. And all of a sudden, to, you know, have to, you know, be responsible and stay home, you know, during this pandemic, it was really tough for me. The first six weeks, you know, I feel bad for my husband, but um, I was bonkers at the, uh, at, at home. I like, you know, sitting out the patio, you know, every single day, yeah, you know, we had our next door neighbor that, you know, we hung out with a lot and everything. Um, but it was tough. It was very tough. And it was just so nice to be able to, you know, okay, I'm going to jump back in and, you know, do some writing, you know, work on some, you know, ideas I have, work on, you know, at the time, infinite retribution. It was very much helpful. And I'm not sure what I would have done without the, you know, without being able to sit there and dive back into some of these worlds. 
But speaking of diving back in, we're definitely seeing that happen too. We're seeing, of course, things reopen across the country. A lot of events have announced they're coming back in the fall, the winter, or early next year. And I imagine for someone like you, hitting the cons is probably a big part of what you do. Are you, do you feel ready to sort of get back into your team prior to all this happening? Uh, not completely. You know, the cons, you know, I haven't, you know, I think about it and, you know, they're just, I'm just not ready uh, to, to go back to those. And for me right now, my priority is, you know, I want to get back out there and, you know, see the world. You know, I have a lot of friends in different states that I've made over the years. And part of, you know, going back to the workforce and traveling again is having the opportunity to see those friends and reconnect with them. Um, but second to that is just my, uh, you know, is doing my writing as I travel. I've always said I'm the most prolific when I'm on the road working. And then at the end of the day, coming back to the hotel or Airbnb or a friend's place and just sitting on the laptop and just typing away. Um, it's just a, it's a weird it's a weird thing about me is that I, I'm more productive when I'm working a full-time job when I'm not working a full-time job. So I don't know why, but it just, it just works for me. So that's a priority for me right now. Um, you know, the, the cons, I'm not sure when I'm ready to go back to them. You know, it's, I think definitely not this year. Um, I'm putting it down the road, you know, for, for now, because I have, you know, where, how my life is right now, works well for me, especially as we get back into the swing of things. You know, how I think having set up right now works for me. So I think I just, I don't want to tackle on too much right now. I just want to kind of keep it nice and steady as we get back into normalization. I don't disagree with you because I hit, all, um, I hit a lot of the cons in the New England area, and I kind of feel the same way. Like, I definitely... Part of me wants to go back. Like, like I'm already on the press list for Rhode Island Comic Con. I'm excited about that, but that's usually a very packed place. And part of me is like, um, I don't know. Maybe I'll just go on Friday when it's a little quieter. And I, I, I find that I need to pick like a small con to be kind of like my shallow end of the pool to sort of get used to it again. You can't just dive right back in. Some folks are all about that. Some folks are all about yeah. diving back in. You know, bring it on. I'm ready. I'll go. And some are like, mm, we'll kind of wait and see. And I'm definitely more in the you know the latter category. Yeah, and also too, in past cons, uh, it's usually when I finish a novel, and I'm still, even though it's out there, it's published, I'm still focused on it. Um, this time around, it's been different. You know, since Infinite Retribution has uh, went, uh, was published back in April, I've already moved on from it. It's still in the back of my mind and everything, but I definitely. And maybe as part of it is because it does represent, you know, I worked on it during the uh, pandemic when things were shut down. And so I've kind of moved forward to that. Let's get back to normalization. Why get back in the swing of things? And with my writing, it's gone back to, okay, let's focus now on, you know, what, what's consuming your mind right now. And so I've kind of also left infinite retribution already in the, in the, in the past. And that would be a book that, yeah, if I was going to go to a con, I would be, you know, using that as a platform to kind of promote and say, hey, this is the latest book I published. And um, I'm not in a space where I'm like really encouraged to do that. So it's uh, it's very interesting. You know, my mindset has definitely uh, changed. You know, my writing mindset has not changed whatsoever. You know, I love being back uh, uh, working again. But it's just very interesting that my mindset about you know, doing the con has changed quite a bit. It's kind of, eh, we'll worry about that down the road. I'm, I'm not ready yet for that. Mm -hmm. This is more of a down-the-road question, but given how the past you know, year and change, we've seen such a shift in how we do releases. You know, We've seen cons and public readings and book signings get replaced with virtual events and Facebook live chats and Instagram live stories, things like that. Is this making you rethink how you'll do release days down the road? Um, it does in that. I think I'm really going to kind of change the format, how I'm going to do it maybe down the road and just kind of, you know, you know, do the announcement, keep fans up to date through, you know, through my, through my blog, through the website, through the Twitter and Facebook uh, pages. Um, you know, and, and Instagram, of course, but, um, and I think 
that's kind of going to have to tailor things, you know, down the road that I'm going to make the announcement. I'm going to do the releases through those platforms and not necessarily try to, you know, you know, reach my hands out everywhere as much as possible and say, okay, I want to do virtual events. I want to do the cons and everything. I think I'm really going to take a step back and say, you know what? These platforms work for me and I enjoy it. I get enough of, uh, you know, I get enough of, uh, you know, an outset to the fans through those platforms. And that works for me. And I'm okay with that. That's the other thing I think that's changed for me is that I'm no longer focused on if I'm going to release a book, how many hands can I get into at once, how many outfits I can reach out to, how many interviews I can do. That's changed a lot for me now. Now I think, you know, I foresee when the next novel comes out, I really foresee that making the announcements and just maybe engaging the fans through the social media sites, not necessarily through virtual events. Certainly, if a fan wants to set one up for me, I wouldn't be opposed for it. But me taking the initiative on my own, I'm not sure I would do that now on the, on the next novel. I've, I've, I feel very comfortable. I've accomplished a lot. You know, I have to, as my husband tells me, you know, Robert, you published nine novels. You know how remarkable that is. Not a lot of people do that. You know, and I take a step back. It's like, yeah, you're right. I did. I'm going to publish more. I'm happy, you know, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to translate into, for me, numbers at this point. You know, if I pick up new fans in the series, great. I hope they enjoy the series and the books and everything, um, you know, but if I don't, and it's just the fans who have read the novels in the past and are going to stick with me as I release new novels, I am totally okay with that. I am a, I'm a very happy place, i got to say, before I, that my writing, I'm no longer aspiring that, you know, oh, someday I hope to be the number one bestseller on any list. No, I, I'm going to put the books out there. Um, I've got the fans out there who enjoy the books, and that's good for me. Is this a new feeling? It is. It is. It's just, I guess, you know, I've maybe it's, it's an age thing as I've gotten older, or maybe because, you know, you know, things have changed in my life this past year, but I'm just very grateful, very happy where I'm at. I've accomplished, you know, not only things in the writing world, I've also accomplished stuff in, you know, in my own personal career, you know, as a, um, as a corporate auditor. And, you know, I'm continuing to do that. You know, I've accomplished a lot in different avenues. And, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm happy with that. It's like, this is what I've done in my, in, in my life so far. And, and I'm still building on those successes. And I'm just going to roll with that. I think that's a great feeling to have because I think for a lot of people, there's this obsession to the next thing. Okay, I did this. Next, I got to sell, like, this book sold, you know, 10,000 copies. Next one's got, you know, got to sell 20,000, 40,000. I got to be on, you know, 20 cons this year. There's always that push to do bigger and bigger and bigger. But it sounds like you are, you've kind of reached a point where you're like, yeah, things are good. I'm cool with it. Let it stay. Yeah, I'm absolutely, even maybe, you know, in maybe some respects, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and just focus on what's important for me. Writing my writing the bo- uh, books and stories, I'm putting them out there and not necessarily be so hung up about, you know, doing, you know, publicity events in the hopes of garnering more sales and get to the next level. It's like, no, that's not a priority for me anymore. It's um, what a priority is for me is, you know, is these stories and putting them out there, use them as my, as I said before, my own therapy and just whoever wants to read them, you know, you know, hopefully they enjoy it and get something out of it. But, you know, sell them in the masses. That's, that was something I thought in my thirties, not so much anymore now, and especially in the last year. I think maybe this, um, this whole thing we all went through just, you know, allow, allows a lot of us certainly allow for me to kind of take a step back as life was put on hold for a good long while to just kind of take a look inwards and say, okay, what's really important to you in your life? What really matters? And I think maybe that's what's happened with me. Hmm. Do you think this will make writing easier where there's no longer the focus on the cash register going? Yes, absolutely. Because, um, you know, cause I'm going to look at it as that I'm writing for me because I enjoy it this for myself. I want to see what my mind comes up with. I want to see what my mind translates when I go through my own life and see how it translates through my imagination. And uh, and that's what's important to me and that 
I'm going to throw it out there and, you know, people are either going to enjoy it or they're not going to enjoy it. And that's totally fine. But I accomplished the goal for myself. I completed the work and, you know, I think I came up with a, a good story, a good expansion upon whatever universe I'm working in or characters I'm dealing with. And that's the, that's what matters to me. Yeah. Hmm. You know, this is dangerously close to becoming a Ted talk. <laughs> uh oh well let me just change this uh, change bills then <laughs> yeah exactly exactly no but 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 in all seriousness i do think it's it's really good to hear this from you it's really good to, that, that you're in this good place where you're focused just on having fun you know doing this it makes you happy you're not constantly wondering okay am i on the best side of the list this time maybe next time maybe, maybe next time because i feel like that grind can really drive you down. It can, it can just grind you basically like they, it's, you know, aptly named because it can grind you into dust. Yeah. And I will say that infinite retribution is the first novel that I've published. I have no idea how it's doing out there. I have never looked at any of the sales numbers. First novel I've never done that with. And I just don't even think twice about it. You know, I put it out there, uh, you know, I've, uh, you know, I did some marketing stuff for it. I've, you know, done, I've done some interviews, but I've never looked at the sales numbers on that, thing, uh, uh, on that novel. And I'm just, when I think about it, it's like, no, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I, I put it out there. It's a good story. And, you know, I've gotten some great feedback from, uh, from individuals who have read it. And, and you know, and that makes me feel good. Um, yeah. The, but, the, you know, what's it translated to monetarily? I have no idea. I haven't even looked at the bank statement to see what how much money's coming on it. <laughs> Are you even remotely tempted to see the numbers? Nope. No. Zero. Zero interest. Zero interest. Yeah, I would have not said that on the uh, on the Jumpgate novel, which I uh, wrote wrote previously. That one, God, within the first month, I was looking at the numbers. All the no novels I did that, I was very OCD about the sales numbers. This one, not. Even like I said, I've I've moved past it already. I've kind of put that in the past along with the pandemic, and I'm moving. I've moved forward with what I'm working on now. So you know, if in a retribution is kind of you know, I'm only going to circle back to it, you know, as I work on the next Exodus uh, novel, you know, to make sure that I have the continuity in place. That you know, making sure I didn't I don't contradict myself on situations or characters that were in that particular novel. You know, when it comes to doing all these different things, do you just pick one at a time or do you find yourself saying, okay, today I'm working on, on this short story. Tomorrow it's going to be the spy novel. The week after, who knows? Um, I have definitely changed how I write uh, over the years. It has pretty much always been, I work on a novel, I work on that story, you know, ifs, ands, or buts. Even though I have other stories circling, circling in my head, I just focus on the one story until it's completed. I even did that with, uh, you know, um, you know, with Infinite Retribution. I started working on the spy novel. Um, you know, I was making good headway with that, but then, you know, the story popped in my head about an Exodus that I had to complete, and I focused on that wholeheartedly. It's changed now. Um, I'm working on the short stories, um, and, and I'm going to be, um, you know, and I think I'm going to be bouncing my time between the spy novel and the new Exodus novel. Um, I can I can definitely say that the new Exodus novel will probably take eight percent of my time, and then the short stories will be kind of a secondary to that. And then once in a while, I'll be working on the spy novel. So I'm slowly starting to learn to be able to work on a couple of things at you know maybe the same time or whatnot. Even at you know on one even in one night, I could be working on one novel and decide okay, I'm good with that for now. Let's switch over to the other novel. That's something that's changed with me as, as, as well. Hmm. I'm curious, as a writer, have you ha have you set yourself a hard rule about not doing anything related to the pandemic, like no stories about bio plagues or germ warfare or any kind of quarantine? Yeah, I will not write anything along those lines because it was a tough year for everybody, um, and I think a lot of people dove into books. Uh, the variety of different types of fiction that was out there, just in his escape to how this pandemic affected all our lives, and uh, people don't need the reminders in uh, in a no in a fiction novel about biohazards or plagues or this or that. If anybody in Hollywood comes out with a pandemic movie 
in the near future, I'm going to be the first one to be like, oh, heck no, I'm not watching that. You know, because we, we've experienced that. We, we dealt with it. It was hard for a lot of us, you know, especially for people who may have lost loved ones. I don't want to give them that reminder by, and, cap, and I felt I would be capitalizing on what happened this past year by writing a novel along those lines. I have no interest, and I don't want to give people that sort of unpleasant reminder. So, no, I will, I would never, I wouldn't even, in the events of the series, I wouldn't even introduce any sort of con- uh, concept about, you know, plagues or things like that. I'm just, that's just a subject I'm not going to touch. You know, I was kind of thinking the same thing when you mentioned the capitalization, because I think I personally, uh, let's say I wrote a short story about some worldwide plague some years back, and it came back in a big way, and it was maybe a lot of money. I think I would have a hard time taking that check, because I'm like, wow, I, given, like you said, a lot of folks, they lost loved ones, they lost careers, they lost their homes. It almost feel a little, I almost feel a little guilty doing it, so I kind of get, get where you're coming from. Yeah, I just, um, you know, I put these books out there for people to enjoy to hopefully get some sort of positive message out of them. I don't want them to, uh, you know, I don't want them to get any sort of, you know, negative feeling or feel, you know, have any harm feelings against an author because they wrote something that hit too close to home. So, you know, I just, you know, I just figure it's just easier just to kind of stay away from those, those particular subject matter. Yeah. Oh, no, definitely. Definitely. Now, what about your reading? Do you have time to read or what do you read? You know, what? that's even changed for me as well. So I've gotten back into reading because I kind of was pretty bad about that. I've actually been reading political books from uh, from, yeah, people in government administrations, um, you know, who and it's just reading because these are individuals, um, you know, regardless of how the press. Uh, you know, uh, may portray them or how, you know, you know people of, on the opposite side of maybe the political spectrum may think of them. You know, a lot of these people who work in the back, in the, in the back of mechanisms of government are very, very intelligent, accomplished individuals. And I've taken the opportunity to read some of the books that some of these individuals have, have written. And it's very interesting and very insightful. And it's kind of like, okay, you know, the media may portray you as this, you know, ultra liberal or ultra conservative, but reading the book from their own words, it's like, wow, this is an intelligent uh, individual who has some insightful things to say. And even if I may not necessarily agree with they, what they have to say, they've got some interesting uh, standpoints and interesting viewpoints on things and explaining, you know, how some of the mechanisms in government uh, it works. And it's, I just found it very interesting and for someone who writes science fiction. I find it I find it kind of bizarre that I've kind of gotten into some of these books, um, but I find them very compelling and very interesting. My thoughts exactly because that is the last thing I would expect. I, I expect you to say, "Oh yeah, I've been reading like Robert Jordan or Stephen King or jo- or Jonathan Mayberry." It said politics. Didn't I've been see that coming. About politics. And and I don't watch the news. I don't watch. I definitely don't watch the the politics stuff on the news whatsoever. I tune that out. I don't even really read any of that stuff uh, in the uh, newspapers or anything. But, you know, these books of some of these uh, individuals have just been very interesting. I'm just like, wow, you know, this is somebody who has some pretty insightful, important things to say. And, and I appreciate them taking the time to write these books for, uh, for the public to read. I really wish more people out there would read some of those books because they can, I think they can really garner a lot out of them. Any ones that you would recommend? Um, I would definitely the one I'm working uh, reading right now. I would definitely recommend is uh, is Michael uh, Bolton. He was the uh, NS, uh, NSC advisor to uh, President Trump, and he was one of those individuals who the media portrays him as this very hardline conservative, and you know, you know, we got to go to war with everybody. And as I've been reading his novel, it was like, wow, this this is a very intelligent individual. He he's not one who shoots from the hip. He's very analytical. He thinks through things. He knows history. That's the important thing too. He has worked in multiple administration. He knows history. He's worked in different branches of government. He knows his stuff. And I find what he has to say very very compelling. Um, it's not you know. Um, I know people assume that he put out this book as to to bash former President Trump, but that's not 
what it is whatsoever. He gives a very insightful look of his experience in that administration. Not only that, but his experience as a you know as a you know as an academic, as a as a government high level government official. It's it's been a remarkable uh, book to read, and I've been very impressed with it. Excellent, excellent. Well, Robert, man, as always, a wonderful time talking to you. I am definitely looking forward to the new works, especially the spy novel. I'm a, I'm a sucker for a good spy novel and the science fiction twist. You got me, dude. You got me. And for the folks at home, you go to robertstadnik.com. That's Robert, S-T-A-D-N-I-K.com. Follow him on his socials. And new book, we will definitely be talking for that. Absolutely. Sounds good, Max. As always, I always appreciate the time chatting with you. Likewise. This is Angelina Singer, author of the Upper World series, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout, the best podcast for independent artists. And that brings this episode to a close. Don't forget to follow the show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. You can listen to this show on all major podcast platforms. Big thanks to Robert for joining me once again, and you can bet he will be back very soon. And if you're like me, you're a huge fan of audiobooks, I'm very excited to announce that my debut audiobook of Wolfish by Matt Ward is now available wherever you get your audiobooks. And as always, keep those ears open.